All right, welcome everybody to Hobby Time with Team Bad Decisions. I'm Dan. We've got Ryan, Nick, and Josh here with me today. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of fun, awesome things, um, some GW announcements as well as uh, some carrying cases and different things like that. So I just want to first uh, welcome everybody to the stream. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, get things rolling here. So, How's it uh, going, guys? You're all good, so you guys okay. can yeah. say hi. <laughs> How's it going, How's guys? Going, guys? Hey. What's up? So, uh, lots going on today. The big preview happened today. Um, and so we'll kind of go over some of that stuff. And then uh, we'll also talk about what we use when we go to tournaments, kind of how we transport things, um, uh, kind of different options. There's a whole slew of different options out there from the cheap to the expensive. And then I think we can start it off because uh, ever since we've all been in quarantine, I'm sure everybody has a project that they've been working on. So uh, let's go around. What's what's everybody working on right now? Right, I'll uh, go ahead, Ryan. I'll <laughs> I'll start off. I've got some uh, Eldar Forge World stuff that I've been sitting on for too long. Got a links a couple of the. Uh, small little they're called hornets they're kind of a little bit uh a little bit bigger than a oh what's a little skimmer not the jet bike viper yeah a little bit bigger than the viper skimmer style kind of look like a shrimp butterfly <laughs> uh they got a couple of cannons on them i got the big forge world links super heavy Eldar tank. And then I've got a uh, Revenant Titan that's that that's just gonna stay on the back burner until it comes down to where I can use him in a two thousand point game. But <laughs> other than how many, that, those, I, how many of those little hornets do you have? Three. Got enough for one right. squadron. I got I along with those at that point I bought some of the uh little wasp walkers too and can't remember who the hell i gave them to now they're they're somewhere in the area but i haven't seen or heard of anybody using them so but uh other than that that's kind of been my project just working on getting a new mostly harlequin based eldar army going and this was a good way to chew up 700 points so I didn't have to <laughs> assemble another 15, 22-piece Harlequin models. <laughs> it, so, it sounds like you were just trying to do, like, like a night list, but with Eldar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty, What's the pretty fewest much. model count? <laughs> well, I think that, if I can't remember for sure, but I think that Lynx is around... 400 450 500 points yeah they're so between that and the yeah between that and the uh hornets i can chew up 900 points real easy if i deck them out with war gear but with the new uh gw did say today in their video that all the forge world stuff's getting redone too so now i gotta wait on that update to uh see how quickly I want to throw these in the trash can. <laughs> so other than that, that's they'll, they'll, they'll probably be broken for you for at least a bit. Yeah. For uh, sure. It, mm. Yeah. If I can, if I can get them done and have them on the table in the first week that the book's out. Right. You like I my uh, pre nerf. I remember, yeah. I used the yeah. Charybdis like crazy before they nerfed it. I liked it. I liked the Charybdis, but when they, when they nerfed it, they added like, like almost 200 points to it and it just made it to where you couldn't take like all the flavor of an army that really took it out of it yeah so hopefully it's well, like there's that. nothing like dropping a bowling ball on the table <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was always afraid of dropping that thing on top of somebody's models well you should have too bad you didn't have the flight stand for it that would have made it even better front do, heavy and have, on a flight stand i do have the flight stand for it. i just don't have the balls to use it <laughs> the babyest plate play stand for a giant model ever yeah right. <laughs> so 
Dan, yeah. what, what are you working on? Uh, so I started a Sisters of Battle Army. Um, nice. I have mostly just put models together. I haven't uh, haven't dinked around too much with like painting or anything like that. But I've been trying to looking forward to playing Sisters for a long time. <laughs> and uh, with the new models coming out, I finally decided to buy a couple boxes and go for that. So with a little bit of spare time I've had recently, that's what I've been working on. Nice. How's that spare time working out for you? <laughs> yeah, for me, it's minimal. So how about you, Josh? What are you working on? Uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing? No, the starting, starting Monday. So I put two massive shelves up here in my office. And aside from the very top shelf that has all the Imperial Knights and the um, Ravenwing gunships or uh, Storm Raven gunships, the next shelf is going to be for table ready models. So my goal is to every other day finish at least one model. Most of my models are based or gray. So every other day, I think get one model table ready, boom, it goes up on the shelf and basically just start eating through all of my stuff. Yeah. Well, that, um, that, that, that contrast paint is real nice for that. <laughs> See, I haven't had a chance to mess around with it at all, so I'll have to, I'll have to pick some up and see how it goes. Well, I was showing you that Star Wars game I've been playing. They, um, I've been playing this board game, and I don't really like. I don't need to win painting award, awards for this because I'm playing with people who just play board games. But like, like that person, less than five minutes. I mean. I mean, it might look like it, but <laughs> yeah, but that to me is tabletop ready, right. whereas it's exactly. functional, whatever. Right. Most of my models look like this. Oh, cool, they're black. They might have a little bit of white and silver on them, but it still looks like junk. Yeah. So I if I spent it's half hour and diddling, you know, messing around with it and make it look more tabletop ready, cool. One model every other day. It's better than no models. Right. <laughs> So Nick, how about I have, you? I have been working on a couple of things. So um, Marcus is notorious for converting toys, and so I thought I'd give a hand. I thought I'd give my a try at that. Um, and I have like, so I'm trying to make a Mutalix Vortex Beast out of this because they don't have a Bone Giant that's uh, from the Tomb Kings that's near. That that thing is like probably about this big, the Bone Giant from Tomb Kings. And it's like eighty dollars for some of that little, um, but this is my current work on that. So I'm gonna make. I have to green stuff this uh, into a portal. I'm gonna green stuff. He's wearing like, um, I want to say it's plate mail, but I'm not. That's not plate mail. It's, I don't know. It's some reinforced armor uh, for the bone giant. So I'm gonna try to green stuff his whole chest armor. He's got a neck piece. He's got a cod piece, and then you know weapon him out so i got a long ways to go on him but that's a start i think one thing that i didn't realize i'd have to do is look at every little joint and glue like crazy even this stupid little thing because it wiggled like crazy i can only imagine how bad that would affect the paint you know and then it's all going to be filling in gaps so there's like he had these things in the side of his head i'm at the green stuff over he had these weird eyeballs that i'll have to fill in to, to make hmm. it look like a skull the I the I, the bone giant has longer teeth. The uh, the incisors are longer, so I'm gonna cut those off and put new ones in there, just to do my best to make it look like a bone giant. Because bone giants are still cool, but they're you're not using them anymore. And the other thing I was doing is I'm trying to learn how to airbrush. So good luck. It, <laughs> yeah, it's a start. Uh, it turns yeah. out I'm just an ape with an airbrush when I was doing it, but. I, uh, this part is mostly done. I was using air colors, uh, but as soon as I started having to thin my own colors, um, the brush I was using, it's a renegade, a chrome renegade. Um, Ooh, that's and it's a, super high detail. Yeah. So that's just tough. Clogging up. That's a very tough one to learn on too. Yeah. I just, I just, uh, I just bought a knockoff, uh, uh, a WADA, the, the, the magnetic, uh, attachment one. No, no, it's the one that everybody uses as like a general purpose. The like it's, yeah, it's, it's just a knockoff. Oh, yeah, yes. I, I have two of them. They're great. 
Yeah. I switch them out. I so. switch them out, and then I throw them like an ass bath afterwards, like thin down with water <laughs> and stuff, because I don't care if they fucking die. Like I, I'll go buy another twenty dollar <laughs> one. Right. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I just they, bought they were a... great for just do mass production. And then I have a so, really expensive one for good stuff. Eric had me. Uh, yeah, Eric Gibbs had me buy one of these to, to wash with. It worked pretty good for the big thing, but yeah. there's some real small pieces inside of that. I couldn't. I wasn't brave enough to put in there. Uh, yeah, so I have an ultrasonic cleaner um, for all of my uh, 3D printed parts and everything, and they work <laughs> fantastic, man. Yeah. Um, it, like, and they there's little uh, uh, you can get little cages for them too, like a little metal cage that the, the stuff will sit inside of if you're worried about tiny tiny pieces. And okay. You, you clip it closed, and then it's like so. It, you know, it's all. It looks like uh, it looks like two halves of a like a drain cover that you put in your drain in like your basement sink. Um, yeah. One of those things, but they have like a little clip that clips it together, and then everything inside there still gets the whole shaking effect from the ultrasonic cleaner. Um, but it's not going to obviously fly around inside the pan. Right. Uh, right. So. Yeah. So. All right. Well, it's good. Uh, we'll. I think as as shows go on, we'll continue to check in on everybody's progress, see how they're doing. Um, as they come on, uh, hopefully I'll have more done on that bone giant. It's been staring at me for. Longer than I'd like to admit. <laughs> well, I that's think my I've next had, step on that. I think I've had these Eldar vehicles for three years, probably four now. Only three or four? That's nothing, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, got, I remember I picking them up. They're a decade old. <laughs> <laughs> I got a couple that are coming up on that. So. Yeah, I, I'm i really good at distracting myself from what I'm supposed to be doing. So, like I said, during the social distancing piece like i've just been painting because i've figured out a way to play a board game via skype so i've been painting all the pieces for that so that everybody who's playing with me can see the guys and kind of tell the difference so most almost all of it's contrast paint and i tell you i've painted this shoot i've got like almost 50 models here and they're all painted a mm, couple hours it's okay. i really like the contrast paint for if you're a board mass gamer. Mass production, yeah. Uh, mass production yeah. Oh, yeah. of models you're not super concerned about making perfect is it's a fantastic paint. Um, For sure. Yeah. <laughs> so all of my models, perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, if you're, if you're, like, especially ones that don't have uh, large like Space Marine type thing or large flat surfaces, if you've got mm -hmm. things like my Dark Elder are perfect for it because they're all freaking spikes and, and stabby bits and everything anyway. So I just slap it on there. It all seeps into the crevices and you're like, this looks fine. Let's put that on the table <laughs> right now. I'm not even going to put a face on it. <laughs> you know, I might, I might actually try some of the contrast. I've got one of the GW paint transport trays that they made to just hold the like 10 or 15 oh, pots. Yeah, 10 of I've got one of those sitting here full of contrasts that a buddy gave me, and I'm going to have to give him a try on these Harlequins because I hate hate fiddly little detail like that. So like what Dan was saying about the face, look at, I mean, yeah, I just slapped flesh tone on him and hold, hold your hand up behind him. Oh, there we and go. That's a little better. That yeah. doesn't look bad at all. Yeah. I, again, maybe less than five minutes i did this guy yeah, it just saves you so much time like i, I get oh, that yeah. like all contrast is essentially is just mixing the regular paints with like a shade and you can get the same effect from you know putting shades on and doing like the extra stuff but the fact that i can just slap one coat of paint on it on the models i just don't care about like if i just need an extra 10 warriors i can throw them together real quick and then you know go because i mean 90 percent of my painting gets done the week of the tournaments so you know, i haven't done a whole lot of painting recently <laughs> because i haven't had many tournaments so right um but yeah, you know, so knowing that that's my my mo, um, it's great that week of. <laughs> that's how that's uh that's when I get most uh, uh, displays done is in that last couple of weeks before a tournament. No matter how big the displays are, that's a uh, tournaments are a great motivator for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every time I'll... man, I don't know what I like. What is wrong with me? I'll have like that whole month. I'll be chilling, just like playing video games and stuff. Like I should work on that. Nah. And then the, the week the week before, I'm like, oh my god, I gotta paint an entire army. <laughs> What's all not make it look like I just did it all week? In? <laughs> We're not bringing talos this time, guys. Sorry, you're sitting on the bench. 
I've <laughs> done that more times than I could think of. Like, well, do I really need the new squads of talons? Nah, I could bring in corn flesh hounds. Yeah, I'm happy. I'll be, with I'll be a little bit weaker, and I probably I'm not going to win the tournament anyway. So I'll, right. I'll take the little hit in power just to to you know not have to paint these 20 models. <laughs> well, that's like me. I've had the last month, month and a week off, so five weeks, no models painted, none. Haven't even but looked at the paints. You have almost got every single achievement in Call of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, life, I do almost goals. have the completionist achievement, yes. <laughs> Just needs to get that juggernaut. Oh, I don't even want to get thinking about it, man. You're going to stress me out. <laughs> so, all right, well, let's roll into uh, how we transport our minis. Uh, so for, uh, for minis like this, I mean, right now, I keep those in the game box. But they're, when this is all done and green stuffed, I, I really like to keep it safe. So, um, mind you, this one can take a beating. I have a lot of uh, miniatures, especially like Dan Dan's army, the Dark Eldar. It's so, like, fiddly and everything gets caught and broken. And, like, every little point, I used to have a Dark Eldar army. There's a, there's a reason I got rid of it. I hated even carrying that damn thing. So, um like how what do you guys use to transport your armies i i generally use battle foam i've got two cases all with custom cut foam for my uh space wolves but given the vast majority of my stuff is all generic bolter in hand or bolter and chain sword stuff so that works pretty well for me i know like right here this picture up is uh my two battle foam cases and it's all just jam-packed i can fit four thousand points in two fair they're sizable cases but so um, what would you say are the best parts about using battle foam uh the fact that they can laser cut the foam to the individual models you can send design it on their website or take a picture of it and email it to them and they'll design the foam opening for you. Um, I know uh, KR Multicase, they've got, they're very good at the generic foam. They do a lot of pluck foam stuff too. And other than that, I've got some army transport, good and expensive case with a couple of layers of foam in it. Uh, that stuff, is, every that stuff is real cheap. We were at a a Defcon one year, and we ended up filling up a whole case for like, like it was a big tall purple case. Yeah, we bought the case and we filled it like filled the top to bottom with foam for like fifty bucks for the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, they're they're solid cases too. Um, the other than that, I mean, there's different brands. What's the, uh, one you've got, Nick, the table Ta war. Yeah. Table, table war, tabletop war, who also makes the, um, fat mats. They make the transport case. <clears throat> um, so I used to have a battle foam one and my, my issue with the battle foam is only, like it is nice to have the trays that are custom made for your army, but if that army ever changes, then you're yep. using like half of it, or you're trying to cram models into spots that don't belong. That that was my only complaint about it. But I mean, if you're not, uh, if you're a marine player, it's easy, it's great. But if you're a marine player, I also think that the G Dub stuff is just as good. Um, but mine, I like to use mine because. I have a lot of models that are either um, I'm looking at a, a bloodthirster that's 15 inches tall um, <laughs> <clears throat> to fit that in a regular size thing, either laying down or standing up. And he's got an, uh, a chain uh, weapon that goes all the way around. So if I lay him down and put something on top of it, I guarantee you when I pull that out, it's broken. So I like the I like my case because you magnetize the base and you put it in a tray and you can give it a 15 inch clearance. And still put stuff above it, below it. There's like a whole tray that you can hold your books, your dice, uh, all that stuff. <clears throat> the only, my only complaint about it is it's it's heavy, 
and um uh which isn't really a problem for me but it, it can be you know if you're carrying 100 million things it could be a tough thing to add on to that but the other part of it is is uh like dan was saying about <laughs> preparing your army the week prior magnets usually tend to be at the bottom of that list so a lot of times i'm just throwing them in there just like anything else and so when they move they're hitting the front of your hard case or hitting the bottom of your hard case so they're breaking there too so <laughs> i should make magnets a bigger priority but sometimes with the newer bases like i really like the the g-dub plastic bases mm -hmm. but there's not a magnet that you can glue there yeah. yeah so you have to build up an area and then glue the magnet on there once it's once that area is built up and so that's that's the only hard thing and then sometimes uh if you have like the little so i'm going to use these guys as a perfect example so with those little feet like that they're just barely mm -hmm. connected if these are fo built in that's fine but if they're glued on like that and then you yeah. go to pull it off of the tray that has a magnet on the bottom of it you know there's a high per a high percentage chance you're pulling the model and not the base <laughs> Oh, come on. Repairing models is always part of the hobby. That's very true. Uh, but if you can get away from it, that's always a bonus, yeah. too. So what do you guys, Josh, Dan, what do you guys use? I, uh, ahead, Josh. I, I, for the longest time I played where as few models as I had to bring as possible was with the way I like to play. So I just brought um, a, a tall case that you normally layer but I would just stand them all up and throw like the pluck foam directly in it, almost like packing peanuts. And as long as it, the case didn't get something heavy set on top, everything was a okay. But now that I'm playing more with a lot of models, I use a, uh, I would think I went to um, Harbor freight and picked up uh, like a toolbox or a little clip thing that has like the different dividers for screws and nuts and bolts. And I just use that to divide it. If I need a bigger space, I pull the slider out. That reminds me of, uh, we always call it the, the Marcus style of packing models. He gets the big, clear, like under bed storage things. Mm -hmm. And then he layers it with t-shirts underneath, on top. I have got a lot of Marcus's laundry at my house right now from the years <laughs> of him <laughs> packing those. I went through and unpacked a lot of my models out of stuff. And I was like, okay, we got another t-shirt, another t-shirt. So it doesn't matter how often I give them to him, too. I've always got more T-shirts because that's what he uses for packing. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, it I, sounds I, like Marcus. <laughs> I uh, I hate carrying around so many boxes and different uh, things. So I built that one big box. I and you guys have all probably seen me um, towed around, which is just like I built a thing for Walmart, just like a huge case that has a latch on it, um, and then I just custom built all the foam inside myself just to make it easy because i got one of those hot knives you can cut foam with mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. yeah so i just i just cut it all out with that so all of my raiders and ravagers which there is no foam that is perfect for those even if you get them custom made there's too many spikes for sure and stuff so just I catch just, the foam yeah i just i just custom like they, they're perfectly shaped to a raider and then you can just slide you know let it in there and it's still a half time i got bits that have broken off or whatever but I don't know how you're going to transfer those models without breaking things constantly. Um, For sure. And then I have two old GW cases, the um, the uh, old school ones, the ones that have the case for all the just regular minis, and those ones mm -hmm. all. Uh, they fit perfectly for, like you said, space marines and stuff, but also because Eldar are smaller, they fit perfectly for the Eldar. Only thing that happens is when you close the case, sometimes like half the dudes have their guns up in the air or something, and they'll stick in the top foam piece, and then when you open the case, mm -hmm. you got like ten dudes like hanging out like, what's up? <laughs> yeah, cool. don't, don't put it down because all of them are broken yeah, now. all of them are broken <laughs> immediately. So, so how uh, often do you guys actually model something knowing that you're going to have to try and pack it like, how often do you model Space Marine purposely so he doesn't have the gun out, he's got the gun down, so that you never. know you can pack it easy? Never. Never, never, ever. I just, I don't have that much forethought, I feel like. Every time I'm like, this will look cool <laughs> I, as shit, what are you like? Hey, I, I can't even, I can't even think about putting magnets on the bases, yeah. much less modeling. <laughs> I think this guy is the closest I've come to that style of 
whoops, he really does fit in the generic GW yeah. slot. Right. And that was purely incidental. Yeah, I just happen to have a lot of old models from like third edition and stuff that just they didn't have a whole lot of dynamic feel to them anyway. So those was fitting. There you go. Perfectly. Yeah. Exactly. Just like that. Yeah. Because yeah, I noticed that a lot of I'm starting to run into you know, because I want to do more of my Grey Knights, but most of my Grey Knights are modeled like this, with the sword sticking way the hell out there. Yeah, that, like, that's a pretty standard Grey Knight pose, though. Right. Yeah. So, or but... the, the one with the two swords. I have one of them. He's modeled like this, like arms way out here. Max. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely no thought went into it before I modeled it. Like, how am I going to transport this guy? <laughs> so that's why I went to the case that I have. So, because ours, our armies tend to be 100% converted. So, trying to get foam that'll fit every model in there is a nightmare. Right. <laughs> so, if I can, if I can magnetize them standing straight up and they can at least stand next to each other, then it's, then it's a win. I just got to start using the magnets. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, uh, next time I see, you, I've got a couple of baggies full of the, little magnets so heck yeah i'll have to drop those to you all right so all right well uh, how about at home do you guys have like a storage system at home like because i found so when i moved into my new house i didn't have really a place to put things so i had like one bookshelf so i found myself throwing a bunch of models onto this one bookshelf and when i got into the new setup i'm in now I spent a lot of time repairing models because you didn't really have a clean way to put them away. So do you guys like leave them in your cases or do you guys get them out of your cases? I've got still got a ton in my cases that I just, I haven't had time to unpack yet or haven't had priority. I've got a, I wouldn't really call it a bookcase, but I've got a very shallow, probably six inch deep uh, cabinet that mounts to the wall. It's kind of a display cabinet type deal. And it works very well because all the shelves are custom, we'll say. Just when whenever I hit Home Depot and pick up a one by four, <laughs> it's like time for a new shelf. But <laughs> that works very well. I can fit the Land Raiders and the huge stuff up top and everybody sits on the shelf very comfortably and I'm good to go. Josh, you'd mentioned you putting shelves in your, in your room there. Yeah. Are they just regular like bookshelves? No, they are just pieces of plywood press board right. or whatever. And I just, I cut them down. They're, I would say 40 inches by 13 inches. And um, then I have another shelf in here that's six feet by two feet. Nice. So I don't have a single model that's in a box. That works. Everything wow. is everything in my, aside from a Land Raider uh, Redeemer, every single model I have is assembled and on display. Wow. So uh, nice. his shelf of shame is very small. <laughs> <laughs> I keep all my crap in the boxes. How about you, Dan? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If I go because I go to regular enough like tournaments and events and conventions and those type of things that like I'm not gonna re repack them every month, every two months, whatever. So unless I need the models to play with friends that come over or whatever, all of them sit in the boxes underneath my gaming table. And they just chill there, and then that way I know that you know that hopefully they're not gonna damage or whatever. Um, and I'm not gonna knock them off a damn shelf. I do have. Warhammer shelves that are full of models, um, but those are typically ones that haven't been used in a while, or uh, you know they're all organized up there with like my D and D models and stuff like that as well. So like the D and D models, it's nice to have all of them racked out. So when you need, you know, I need a you know carrying crawler, I can just grab it right off the top and and throw it on the table and stuff like that. So those are really nice for that. And then for the Warhammers though, um, yeah. I just pull it all out. And if it does get pulled out to be played with here, then it goes on a shelf afterwards. Right. But, but we, um, yeah, they stay in the box. So, again, I moved into a new house last not too long ago. And so we redesigned the whole basement 
to have enough storage for my models. And so I've got like four bookshelves and then cabinets underneath. Uh, the cabinets have all the bits. And I have a drawer of shame instead of a shelf, a shelf of shame. Uh, <laughs> so I have all the models out and displayed. And I kind of had to customize like how big some of the openings were. Um, I'm looking at, I mean, I mean, I've got, I've got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, probably ten or twelve models over twelve inches. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the standard shelving is really tough to get that at. Um, so. Yeah, so the, the 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 custom shelves is where I had to go to get that. But my plan is is I usually will keep an army in my case, and now that I have all my army displayed, I'll just be able to swap it out a lot faster. And if people come over, it's already out. Yeah, Makes but sense. I did this right before uh, we like I haven't touched it since I went to the last my last tournament. I mean, I haven't had to put an put an army together since then. Right. So, what model do you have that's over twelve inches? Uh, well, which it's one or uh, which 10? Uh, well, I mean, because <laughs> like my, my tallest model is the gunship, and that's on its stand, and that's 10 and a half inches. I have two bloodthirsters. Oh, the wings. Yeah, all the way up to the wings is 13 and change. Uh, on Jeez. this one, I have another bloodthirster. It's 15 and a half inches to the top of his wings. I have my um, Lord of Skulls, my converted one. Um, he's about 12 exactly. But we have another knight that has the um, Age of Sigmar. It's like a thing that's got like a, like, a, like a planets and all this other stuff on top of it. That got put on top of the knight. And it's one of those really super tall knights from Dreamforge. And I've got another, another thing that we converted out of this model. Um, that's up higher. So I've, I've got a lot of knights that are, or a lot of things that are real tall. Hey, Dan, you going to get out your tall model and I'll show you mine. <laughs> yeah, I don't have, uh, anything super tall. Like the, probably the tallest thing I have is the Wraith Knight. No, I mean, those, those things are freaking massive, but I haven't yeah. used it because they're terrible for years. So, mm -hmm. yeah. which is great. I'm so glad they're terrible for years. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when they I'm, weren't. I've got my Reaver in the uh, out in the garage still in the big cargo tow that we took it down to Adepticon in, I think, three years ago. So, uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's that's good examples of how people store their stuff and yeah, uh, things like that. But I think the real topic of the day is the GW preview. Did Do you want to take a, a short break real quick and uh, come back in like two or three minutes? Let we can do that. And grab a drink, uh, use the bathroom and stuff like that, and then um, we'll start up on the BGW preview. Yeah. Sounds, Sounds great to me. Sure. All right, cool, everybody. We're going to be uh, right back. Short intermission here, and we will see you momentarily. Stick around.
All right, we are back. We're going to talk about the big GW announcement. If you want to start us off here, Nick, on that. Uh, well, so that happened uh, at Eastern time. It happened at like 9.15. Um, so I didn't catch it. I only caught the aftermath. But who all caught it live? I, I did. Yeah. Was there a lot of like, because I know when they do that live, sometimes the comments are either like the comment section. I always like to read as people comment. And sometimes it's really like negative or positive. How was the feedback to all of the previews as they were coming? 70-30. 70-30 what? 70 positive? positive yeah, 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 seven, yeah, 70 positive. That's good. Uh, Ryan, did you have the chat open when you were watching it? No, I didn't. I had it had my Bluetooth on and was listening oh, okay. to it while I was at work. So that's good. I mean, I always like to um I I think one thing about the community is um, is that I th I want to th see the voices get heard and I think G Dub's been a, doing a really great job about uh, hearing people and fixing issues as they come. Now, yeah, are they perfect, no, but it's a really big global company, so one person's gripe uh, can't always be fixed. But I think uh, they do a pretty good job. I mean. This is coming from like sixth edition and seventh edition, where they, where their answer was D weapons. You know, yeah, well exactly. they're, yeah, well they're at least listening now. They may exactly. not be responding to everything, but they're listening. So, yeah. So the one of the first like the thing that they kind of like previewed the preview with was the logo, and I've seen a lot of feedback on that logo. Dan, are you <laughs> able to put the logo up? I, I can throw it up real quick. Go ahead. And, All right, uh, cool. Uh, so, Josh is about to have an art seizure. <laughs> so I don't, I mean, they need, it's been, this logo has been the same logo for, shoot, fourth edition? Uh, yeah, late late third, I think Armageddon campaign is when it the current logo got introduced. So, I mean, I you think. You need to root a good thing, man. <laughs> yeah, but I think personally, yeah. like, like they've updated the boxes, they've updated like the all the whole aesthetics of everything else. I, I don't, I don't think it hurts to update the logo to keep with the times. I mean, because I really like the Age of Sigmar, uh, act, uh, the hammer. I really like that logo, and so that's yeah, been that an update. Definitely superior. Exactly, that's yeah. a real sharp logo. So well, and that that one's a newer newer happening too, because that one didn't get introduced till last year. Right, yeah. Warning. This is probably. <laughs> huge when it comes in okay that's so, okay but i mean i i personally i don't know my my thoughts on the logo is i don't have a problem with it but that doesn't i mean it, i'm not in love with it but i mean if you fall in love with the logo you might be looking at the hobby for the wrong reasons <laughs> it's so i know josh has an opinion and is an it's he's not a fan and i'm dying to hear I, why that is I I'm, can agree with his opinion. So first and foremost, the R sticking out the side. It is the first thing I noticed, and I don't know why it's not like I'm some sort of graphic designer or anything like that, but just move it to the yeah. left a little bit. Can, you know? can we blow up that R in the, <laughs> on the end? Stop it, Ryan. Just... Hold on. Let me, uh, let me help you out here. I got you. Oh, you're talking about <laughs> out the side of that line? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hold on. I can see that. Maybe it's the angle you're looking at it. It might nope. be one of those 3D pictures. <laughs> no, nope, it's not. You just got to turn your. You just got to move your camera. You got to move your phone a little bit. <laughs> right, right. It's one of those like you're scrolling through your Facebook feed, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can tilt my phone this direction. <laughs> oh yeah, now that's gonna bug me. I didn't yeah. see that. Why? Why <laughs> it, it out? Now you're a dick. Right. <laughs> Cannot oh, unsee. But between that and the A isn't logo. centered in the logo. And I mean it's just nitpicky shit, Here but I'm gonna make this thing huge. Here, ready? Multi multi million dollar company and they can't and it's shore up this logo. <laughs> that R <laughs> doesn't look that way in every single logo either. No. It's only some of them. Well, again, this is the preview for the logo. So no, I don't yeah. know that's the logo. And the, the that's the new logo? 
Yeah, the weird part is so it, what it looks like from a graphic. I I did you know graphic design stuff. The A is slightly not centered, which doesn't make any sense why that R is overlapping, right? So like yeah. they should have if, pushed it to the left. I I actually agree with him here to make this because that A is the center letter of the word because you've got you know four on the right of it, four on the left of it. It should be basically centered on the logo. So yeah, I mean that does you know, even messes with my head. I also and I mean I. I could go with one or the other, but not both. I mean, I don't really I, like the, the the fact that they put this freaking line through it too, like the top why like it's off center to the top end, and that's just it's seemingly because, well, we don't want it to go right through the center of the E's and the H and stuff, so let's just offset it slightly to the, the north side of it, which is just weird. Well, yeah. well, they're they're aiming for the '90s Mech Warrior vibe here, and it's they a top you know, they logo. hit it right. Right on the. It is a Top just Gun perfectly. logo. Yeah. But see, I like Top Gun, so. Well, I'm not saying it's. <laughs> is it, is, hold on. Is it also just me, or is the top um, of the the logo got like a little like eye on one side where it's black, the like where the little uh, eagle looking pieces, and then the other side doesn't. That that is true to. The lore, though. Okay. Okay. Because one one eagle head looks forward towards the future, and the other or. Uh, Hang on. One's looking to the past and can see, and the other's blind to the future. Okay. So. Oh, okay. See, now now we're getting schooled on some lore right now. <laughs> yeah, see, see, where were you guys yesterday? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have a strike through it, but man, it is real close. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, they're very Top Gun-ish, yeah. Oh and yeah, the strike through just—I don't know—it just doesn't look good in my opinion. But yeah, that that strike through screams BattleTech or Mac Warrior to me. And but even the BattleTech it, ones, it the looks... Mac Warrior ones, were through the center at least. Yeah, yeah. It looks so, like the logo of a ninety-nine cent app store download. <laughs> so is well, the, uh, is they the complaint be... about the logo more, or sorry, the strike through more that it's not centered. Just that it's there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to say that it's theirs. And, and Warhammer is, at least in my thought process, is a very gritty game. And that looks rather cutesy. So, compared to this one, again... I, what I makes don't feel the, like yeah. I don't feel like they really did like this like you got your like when you were first talking about it, like it's some huge modernization. They they oh man they really they really did they redid the logo. It's almost the same dang thing with just a different skin color. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. see that. They they put a couple crappy add-ons in it. Like let's put the strike through and let's move the R off center, and the A, <laughs> and then it's the same freaking logo. And I get they're trying to stick with it to an extent, but why did they need to do that if they didn't weren't going to do a good job or do a complete redesign? The Age of Sigmar one when that was completely redesigned. That thing looks mm -hmm. good, man. Like, yeah, I really like that one. I really like that one. I feel like they could have done something similar for 40k. And what? What? I mean, I get it's just letters, I'm... but like, yeah. I mean, hell, let's call Banksy. Let's get him in here. <laughs> I mean, he'd he'd go to town on it for a quarter of hell, a quarter pounder cheeseburger. I don't know. He's a weirdo. Well, it, <laughs> it, it almost kind of reminds me, Dan, what you're saying about um, video game controllers. You either leave it the same, or you go Nintendo route and completely yeah. flip the script. Do redesign oh. and make it better, um, and then you take a chance, right? Like you, you take a Any, shot in the dark. Anybody oh. bring their third hand today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the the old the sixty four <laughs> controller. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, I like that controller. So, right. aside from the logo, they had a video. They went through like nine different uh, things that they're going to be changing, and I I watched that video recently, and I, I mean, I, there's a, there are a few pieces in there that I got pretty excited about. So, um, the number the number one thing was like, oh look, you can play with your army still, and it's like okay. So I think it's nice that you can still use your codexes and stuff and all the campaign material, because yeah. I know when they updated from sixth to seventh, that campaign material felt like it was out the window, and there was a lot of like every time they've done a campaign, it seems like it seems like. It goes right out the window. It's not use, used anymore. Yeah. So I wonder how useful it'll be in the new edition. But I'm glad that they're keeping it so you don't immediately throw your books away. Well, they said so, 
point blank psychic awakening was written with ninth edition in mind that's and that's great but again we were told that about oh what was this it, uh wrath of magnus sorry i had the book right in front of me wrath of magnus was supposed to be some great thing that leads in leads into the next thing but it didn't oh uh, it, it did it was the peak of hero hammer yeah so the number two point was join the crusade which um was the um the idea was that they're going to make the narrative uh feel a lot more useful so currently the narrative piece is like you could take power you could use a power level or you could just throw a bunch of models on there and play the narrative mission and you've done a narrative thing now but it feels like <clears throat> based on the video and a couple of the other comments you can level up you can level up characters or squads you can get new things so it's it almost feels more rpg you know and you have a reason to play through a whole campaign instead of like i don't know i don't know i'm sure there are people that have done the campaign and i don't know what drives people through that except for just to have a reason to hang out with the boys and play now i really think that idea is kind of cool but i'm an R I like rpg games so I may try this as a narrative thing, but I've never because I've never played narrative before. Would this be something that you guys would try? Uh, I I want to say I'd be into it, but at the same time, I've barely got time to play at the tournaments I go to now. Gotcha. And like one of one of our friends, he's putting together a sister's army and. He's just waiting for, I guess, the first our stay-at-home order is supposed to be dropped. And he's dying to come over to my place and get a game in with his sisters because God knows he's not going back to work anytime soon. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for that. I... Yeah, so I really so what did they call it? Crusade or something like that? Yeah, yep. yeah, the crusade. So one I step really back, did they give us a oh ahead, sorry. No, no, go no, no. When did they give us a timeline when this is gonna be released? No, they didn't give any they dates that I yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. What were you saying, Dan? I apologize. No, you're good. I, I really like the narrative campaigns. I actually almost enjoy those, like doing the the I was talking with Ryan about it yesterday. Um mm -hmm. I really enjoy doing the ones where okay here's the first mission what happened in that mission here's the consequences in the second mission and what happens and then you move forward like i did all the unari ones when they first came out in seventh and we used those into eighth uh just as uh, a campaign to do for me and my buddy uh adam and uh we did that and we had a great time man we did like three mm. or four battles in a row and uh it was just cool to see the sequence of events and okay well this is what happened to you because this happened and stuff like that so i i really enjoy those ones now that reminds me, I did do one campaign. I I, I remember, but it's, I mean, it's been years. It's path the path to glory campaign. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really cool system where you basically roll uh, your army at random, and then every time you win or lose, you get the different roles impact your army in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I thought Mini Wargaming did a great job of updating that because at first it was just the four chaos gods. But now, like, Mini Wargaming added a table for, like, every army. And yeah. I, I, I got to remember where that's at. But it, They have a narrative campaign on their thing that's all about that. So it's actually really cool to watch overall. Yeah. Some of their but stuff is I, goofy, but yeah. Yeah, that Path to Glory, though. I mean, because, again, the Chaos one, I play Chaos, so it was easy for me to get into. But if you're not playing Chaos, then the Path to Glory idea is not useful to you. But right. if you add in all the other armies, I really like that randomness uh, – uh, me and Brandon played through a, a few of the missions, and there were, like, right up front, uh, I got my teeth kicked in. And then, you know, the next game, uh, because I got Blood Crushers, it was a different game. You know what I mean? So the game's kind of changed, and it's not just one army versus another, and it's not... Go ahead. Did you ever play those, uh, that planetary, uh, what was it, planetary Sol or planetary empires or whatever it was? <laughs> yeah. Uh, way back, I think it was, like, again, Thursday. I did it. I did it for a few missions way back in the day. Uh, I think 
I think sometimes campaigns, uh, especially like that one, suffer the same thing that like D and D does. You got to have a solid group that yeah. are consistently play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we I have the um the tiles that were the campaign map for that with all oh, the yeah? pieces and everything, and I've got actually two sets of them, so we can make a huge campaign thing. And they have the little flags that come with them that we painted colors, so that when you take a territory over, and so what me and my friends did um when we were playing really consistently before the coronavirus thing, every week we would play. And what we initially started with was a campaign where, okay, we're going to have a neutral army. And then we, I set up two tables in my basement, my main game table. Then we just threw a plywood sheet on another uh, folding table and put a uh, mat on it. But um, what would happen is, so the first the game night, everybody's going to get two games, basically. basically. And if you want to take a territory where a neutral party is, then, okay, that's going to be tower, orcs, or whatever our extra armies were that were laying around. And then we just, and then you got every round, you got a certain amount of points that you could either add or subtract from your list and your total army as you were progressing through the area. So then if you were attacking somebody else's area, you'd play that player that night. But if you're attacking the neutral army, like I'd play the Tau, like, okay, well, here's the Tau army. And it really was neat because what it also allowed us to do was all the extra armies that we have that, you know, you might, you might not play orcs. Um, and so you you're gonna play as the bad guy orcs though today so you're gonna use my orcs to play against my dark eldar and uh you're gonna learn how to play orcs so it, it, taught, <laughs> it taught you how to play those different lists and then everything and that was kind of i thought it was pretty cool that is cool so uh maybe we'll have to figure out how to get a league started on on something with with those ideas in mind once this all gets once once we can <laughs> so the the next point was uh, in the video was start with more command points, which I'm in uh, favor of. See, for some so, armies, I, I mean, what army? The, then you go to you look at Imperial Guard and uh, Imperium in general, and you're like, oh, cool! You so you have 25 command points. That's you know, that's fun. Well, they also they made like <laughs> they made reference that it's not that it's not going to be beneficial for soup, that it's going to be beneficial just for your army. So I'm interested to see. Not only are you going to start with more command points, but I feel like they're going to make you use it for your the army that you took them with, and I think that's great. I, to, in my opinion, all the command, um, all those stratagems and stuff, add a lot of flavor to the army. Like, oh, like I think Vect is a perfect example of it. Like people abuse the hell out of it, but that's such a dark Eldar thing to do. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I really like the flavor of some of those things. Like for me as a corn player, being able to attack again is very thematic, you know? Yeah. And so I think the stratagems are great. Now, if they can eliminate some of the soup options and we get more command points, I don't know. I feel like you're going to feel the flavor of the armies a little bit more. They, man, I want, I can't recall exactly what was said, but somebody asked a question and the response was essentially, you get more command points if your army is all one thing, and you'll have to use command points in order to take units from a different army. Really, that would be kind of neat. So the big problem is. I have with the with the the soup list is that you have so like you have Eldar who has three options, right? To to soup in in the you, know, so you pick and choose the crazy units. Imperium is ridiculous how much you can you can pick and choose which ones you want to use and soup in. And then the same thing for Cast. But then you go to like these other armies like you know Tau and Necrons and like I understand that those are more fringe armies, but they're still a big part of the the whole thing. And they just get screwed in those things every single time, mm. and they can't do any of the pick and choose, pick and choose, pick and choose. Um, and I, it just it, it frustrates the heck out of me to, to come and, you know, play somebody in a, a casual game or even a, a tournament, whatever, and see, okay, so you have, uh, you know, three detachments of three different armies, essentially, uh, from the same Space Marine stuff. And, oh, yeah, you, I see you pick and chose the exact things you needed to make them the nastiest things you could be. So, right. I don't know. I, don't I really think like that it, also I think eliminates... I hope they do, do away with it in some manner. Yeah, and there's a lot of depth into people that have to mix... That mix and match and make soup armies. So I have to know more about chaos and Imperium, especially even as a oh, top yeah. player, just to understand why they're able to mix, why this thing benefits that thing, and, and they're not even from the same army. Right. You know, what I mean, you have to do like a lot more homework, I think. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, go ahead, Dan. 
I was just gonna say that the and the, the most frustrating thing, and the, and the obviously most frustrating thing, is that using the Imperial Guard is just your your uh, mm -hmm. generator. Battery. Right? That, that, that's all they are. They are complete and utter trash to all the armies that just use the bejesus out of them just for CP. All they're doing is throwing them out there as a screen and the CP generation. It's just like that's a poor way to, in my opinion, to go about developing an army and getting you know selling models and and everything like that for that army i think you should make a good imperial guard army set that allows you to do that without having to soup in other imperium stuff or could you imagine the what it would end, cost go ahead. could you imagine them have to buy all those knights with cp <laughs> right, right. So, and, that, and then also like i'd like to see more marines right so like right? I'd, I'd like to see marine uh -huh. players stop using freaking imp, imp guard and stuff for their uh, troops and everything, and you like to see more reads. I mean, that's the iconic figure of mm -hmm. the game, and you're not even using the dang thing 90% of the time. Right. Well, is that why they're pushing Primaris so hard? Um, I think Primaris has always been the replacement for uh, regular Marines. I think that's why they're pushing them so hard. Now, mind you, it, thematically, they are more the true scale. Um, there were other companies like Chapter House, which I don't know if a lot of people know about that lawsuit. They sold true scale Marines that were real nice. I mean, and they were they were Primaris basically. So I th I think that's part of the reason that they're doing what they're doing with Primaris. But they wanted to do it slow. To I'm sure it's not to I'm sure they were trying to eliminate some of the griping. But I mean, well, who uses regular Marines now? Right. So well, they made them crappy. I know, and I think it's on purpose. They, I, they, I think I think I agree. I think it is on purpose because they're trying to phase out those Marines, mm -hmm. and rather than reduce the cost or make them as effective, because the fact that a Marine is so much more expensive than <laughs> everybody else's true models is like, okay, well, what's going on here? They're not that much more effective, but they're that much more costly, right? So like, right. a Marine, yeah. in, you know, fourteen points to my Kabbalite warrior who's seven. It's like, yeah. well, okay, I mean, I get it. They have better armor, but their ballistic skill is the same. Their guns are almost identical. You know, the, the amount of damage they do and everything is almost identical and everything like that. So the only thing that this Marine is double the cost of is because he has a three-up save instead of my five-up. Yeah. Force obsolation. <laughs> I, I agree. I they're just trying to get them out of it. That's thing they're just trying yeah. to sell. They're trying to sell more models. And it's, it's the same oh, amount that sure. they always have. So point number four. And I, I like this point. Um, I don't think it was a big deal, but it says tanks tanks are back on track. And the, the what their explanation behind that was is that tanks uh, can now fire even when they're in close combat. Tanks are going to have more of a tank feel. Um, and I think that makes sense. It never made sense to me that uh, a bunch of guys in combat with them stop their shooting. Yeah. If you're thinking thematically. Now, uh, game mechanic gameplay wise i don't know how that's going to impact the game but um it's not a reason to put together my land raider let me just raise right. the yeah. power level of tanks dramatically right half the yeah. way you, you stop parking lots from you know going off and, and being just absolute home wreckers is by putting them in a close combat so you remove that component they better have another balance for it the guns on those tanks better be either reduced or you know whatever they might lose at least lose ballistic skill in close like i get what you're saying but the main the whole idea like if you look at actual like you know war tanks if you get in close to it the whole idea is that you can't use the big cannon on the person standing <laughs> underneath right. their treads so well, like, if they're standing yeah. under my treads, I don't really care about. <laughs> but I wonder them. if they'll, I wonder if they'll give them a mechanic similar to knights. Um, what was the old mechanic where you basically just get to choose to run through a squad? Uh, tank shock. Tank, tank shock. shock. I wonder if it would be oh, something that similar was, to that. That was amazing in a Rhino Rush army. Who who the needs old old yeah. tank shock was the yeah. fifth edition one was such like a waste of time yeah, yeah. i mean I, so, I just hope they balance it well we'll see so the thing i think i'm most excited about of the nine points uh beside the crusade thing is there it looks like they're going to fix terrain and they listed a number of ways that they're they're talking about fixing terrain but i don't know if they're trying to just be thematic or like um or if these are actual things you're going to be able to do. They were talking about, you know, being able to be on top of something and getting an advantage on your your enemies or being able to sneak up on somebody. Now, I'm sure that one's going to be more of a line of sight, like 
they can use it more of a line of sight blocking kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But like right now, terrain means very little. Little, yeah, little to nothing. My uh, my yeah. dreadnoughts can't get to the second floor. Yeah. The, my tanks can't, God forbid, assault anybody standing on a crate. I mean, <laughs> come on. Uh, with with terrain, I know this is a kind of an odd rules question, but if you're on the second floor and an Imperial Knight walks up, can the Imperial Knight punch the dude on the second floor? It nope. is a stratagem. <laughs> More command points. I can't remember the name of the stratagem, but yeah, I mean, I've seen it done either way, though. I've seen so... TOs that ruled that towards they that you could attack that way, um, and I've seen TOs that roll it the other way. So it... oh. The rules is written. It I don't I don't think they can because their bases aren't within one inch of the base because you're measuring base to base. But uh, right. rules as intended, obviously that that's silly. So right. Yeah. So the I don't remember point six. Clearly, I it wasn't important to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> point seven <laughs> was be strategic with your reserves, and it seems like they're gonna mess with the reserve mechanic. The way that they were talking about it, again, I, you got to discern the fluff from like the actual mechanics. But they're, it sounds like they're talking about using it more of a, a sneak or an intentional drop, or like I don't know if there's going to be different benefits. Um, I'm curious if they're going to bring back the random, the randomness. I doubt it. I really hope they don't, because I know I used to play uh, Deathwing. And if my damn knights <laughs> fell off the table, <laughs> oh, come on, one more time. <laughs> all all you got to do is table. position them nine inches from an edge. They won't possibly fall. Oh, there they go. <laughs> well, that's like, uh, was it gene stealers that you could um, come in from the table edge? Mm -hmm. Like they mm -hmm. could either come up in the middle of the board, but maybe they're looking to do something like that with the reserve. You come in from the table edge rather than dropping in yeah, well and that would be like the outflanking that yeah I, I i like those ideas the the idea that your reserves are coming in from a flank area uh, position or a different edge th that makes sense uh like to be able to use that and right. i think it's also i think it's a good idea to make a benefit for reserves that all armies can use because it'll put less alpha strike problems on the table, right? So, like, if your whole army's sitting out there um, right away, the big they they need to do something about the alpha strike problem in the first round yeah. of the edition because yeah. they've done some things to try and mitigate it slightly, but it's still ridiculous. It's a ridiculous problem. The percentage increase in win rate of people who go first and get to blow the crap out of you oh, is thank ridiculous. You. So. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. point number eight, I'll be on, I'll be on uh, which I am interested in, it's, it's, they say have a blast. And they make it, you know, in the video, they make it, they show a knight blowing the crap out of a whole bunch of gaunts, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is the return of blast templates. Yeah. I hope so. I'm, I'm, I'm mixed on it. I, I like the auto hitting with flame weapons, but. At the same point, the whole, what was the length of the old blast, flamer blast template? About eight inches, about the same. Yeah, yeah. Eight, eight and a quarter, something goofy. Well, I don't know. I, I like wonder if that. they're going to affect, I like flame templates. I like the flamer effect as it is now. Um, I think it's much more potent now. Uh, mm -hmm. I just wonder if the intent here is to add more of that splash damage. You know what I mean? Like, like I remember hitting hitting in a spot and destroying like three units with one blast template oh yeah well and now is, it's a d6 and right. no, it well, doesn't the other matter thing is you can't before i i like the the thematically i like the idea that okay this big ordnance blast template's gonna you know come down and on this unit here's where i'm gonna shoot it my guys are three inches away over here though they're just chilling we're gonna ordnance blast in then they're gonna do great and then you roll like crap 
it ends up freaking jumping it back four inches, and you're like, oh, cool, my whole squad's under this freaking blast template now. <laughs> I thought that that was a neat idea. Like, the, the idea that, okay, you can friendly fire your own guys on accident yeah. because they end up under this blast template. Dan- Auto danger hitting things, close. I get the simplification of the rules and why that was, you know, something that they wanted to do. I don't necessarily think that they needed to do it with those, though, because blast templates and flamer templates, the only issue I ever had with them was the argument of, is that guy's foot under this? Mm-hmm. I hated yeah. that. I think that they should just make it, is the entire model under the Ordinance Blast template, and move on. Or is 50% of the model, or whatever. You you know, you can make it, rather than just, you know, a fraction of the base is under it, and then you have to have a discussion right. about that fraction of base. Where are you holding it at? Make it, you know, is 50% of the model covered? That way it's not even a foot issue, it's just, is it 50%? Yes? Okay, great. We move on. There's always going to be an argument about that, but... I think that it'll, that will reduce it, and they'll still bring back that fun, okay, here's my, my big boom, and see what happens, and roll some scatter dice to see what happens. I thought that that was a big part of Warhammer that was really, really fun, and they took that away. It was like, okay, I get your reasoning, but it kind of, I don't know, it just dumbed down the game too much for me. Yeah. Yeah. I do I do like that they eliminated some of the randomness. So, like, because, I mean, if you scatter think dice. about it, I mean, right now, ordnance can hit a doorknob. <laughs> so why... Right. Why is yeah. the guy right in front of you missing? You know, those kind of things. I, I get some of that. If you want to, if you're, like, thematic versus game mechanic. Like, for me, the the simplification, like, the randomness of hitting. I'm mm-hmm. with you, Dan. I hated that argument. I can't think of how many times I've had that argument mm-hmm. of, is this guy under the template? Is it not? And then you have that one guy who's always like, nope, he's not. Yeah, absolutely not. And you have to fight with him. And it's like, come on, dude. Sure. He's clearly half under. And I always hated that. It just always seemed like it added something like that to the game. I always hated the scattered dice. It's like, oh, no, it goes this direction. No, oh. like, let me pull out my laser pointer that projects a straight line. Here you go. Mm-hmm. That was yeah. another one. I, again, I, I get why they got rid of it. I just thought it was a nice thematic, cool thing mm-hmm. to do. And, and I mean, it's what it is. Like, it's not going to make or break me playing whether or not that thing's there. Sure. So. So I had a really cool temp. There was a really cool blast template that I had, and we call it the Q template. And it basically had, it was circular, and it basically had um, a blast template off, or a flame template come out the side. So you can use it for multiple different things. Like the inner circle was a small template, the outer circle was a large, mm-hmm. and then a, bla- a flame template. But on the flame template, the the back end of it comes to the center of the holes, and then there was measurements off of there. So you could take. The like if it were seven inches that way, you put the seven on the center, and then you put it over there, and then you have the seven inch movement that hovered over, and it was real easy to measure and use. Um, but outside of that, I mean, it was still. <laughs> I always had a hard time with blast weapons when that happens, but I agree with you; they're still fun. I like the idea of hitting like like the other thematic part about it is you had to it forced you to put your units more spread out than clumped together. I like the idea of Ryan using his apocalypse template. <laughs> <laughs> the big old, big old pie plate. Yeah. yeah. Those of you that don't know the, uh, was that sixth edition, Nick, that they I, came out with that apocalypse set? I, I think so. The large apocalypse blast template was 14 inches, I think. I think so. From side to side, it was so big. It was in a normal, came in a normal GW size, like Land Raider box that was probably an inch and a half thick. The <laughs> template was four pieces snapped oh, yeah. together. Yeah. So, point number nine was Freedom of the Skies. And it mm-hmm. sounded like they're going to be doing. Oh, yes some <laughs> correction to flyers yeah josh you guys you're celebrating what's going I on? Am oh, celebrating. Yeah. so it sounded to me like you can fly off the board it doesn't die it just comes back the next turn yep and then um unfortunately i only caught a bits and pieces of this because i was making some food but i could have sworn they said a that lot of food. Yeah, a lot of food Moving your flyer, it doesn't make any sense that you can't move somewhere because there's guys on the ground that you're clearly flying way above. Mm-hmm. So that I, I think they said something about that they were going to revamp that. Hmm. 
So that's something I'm excited about too. Yeah, I'm 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 super excited. Yeah, I'm super excited about that. I've spent way too much time converting my flyers, and they sit on the shelf now. (laughs) All right. So the last thing I was just going to kind of go over is they did also put out a Q and A about like things that things that people should know about the new edition coming um there was one that was like uh why have another edition and it was just talking about like we've had this one for three years we uh, you know we've had a lot of feedback and we want to add it into the game um i i don't know what everybody's thought is on like a new edition versus a new like just adding the rules, but I th- I think the new edition always is a good reset for that kind of thing. So um, they also say they talk about what are their new models, of course, new logo, of course. Yep. <laughs> can you can I still use my army? They said of course, and it includes uh, everything from the edition. Uh, it listed all the campaign books: uh, Vigilist, Psychic Awakening. Uh, white dwarf supplements are still going to be useful. Um, the four jeweled indexes will be changing. Um, our points going to change. They say yes. A new edition gives us the opportunity to reset balance and power of the whole game. Hmm. And um, uh, that's it. They they revamped the website. That's another thing they were excited about. Oh, and the app. I'm really excited about the app. That the app for Age of Sigmar is super useful. Uh, I mean. Dan Dan uses it probably more than any of us. He, he could probably give us the best feedback on that, but I've used it a few times. I think it's a really useful app. Yeah, so I used it when I played with Adam and stuff like that, and then we went to that tournament and did the team tournament for Age of Sigmar, and it was super useful. You can look anything up quickly. It's our, your army. You can build it right there in the application. Nobody can argue with you about you know it being messed up or whatever. It's like, here, it's GW's product. Here you go. Yeah, and it's always um, the most up-to-date rules, right? right. They update the, so, they update yeah, the rules so inside of that. So if they do it the same as the way Age of Sigmar is, the FAQs that they have for Age of Sigmar typically are in that app within 24 hours. Like, it's very good at updating the information in there. So you can build all your armies out and everything like that. And then what Adam does um, for his Age of Sigmar stuff is he just brings a tablet with him, has all that stuff right on there, and bam, there you go. You can you know slide to whatever, build your army right there on the tablet, and then you're good to go. And I think that's the future of like uh, lists and stuff like that. Um, you know, being able to... Uh, be in that thing and then just send like okay here's my list and oh what's your well, you know what's your email or what's your 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 tablet your warhammer name or whatever send it to you on there and then you can have my list and then there's no you know you don't have to physically bring a copy of a list for everybody and then did i put it in the right spot or whatever um to me that's that's a that's a benefit and i think that they'll do a good job with it hopefully um it's just whether they do a good job with it that'll be the deciding factor right right you mean no more having to print out 12 page battle scrap lists right right yeah, and it also, like, I mean, think about it now. There are those people that, I, I mean, I'm one of them. I personally like the, remember the little cards that they give you? Age of Sigmar was really good for this. They didn't, yeah. they only did it for uh, the knights. But you get those little data sheet cards, and you can set them down in front of you. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how this gets organized, is all those little data sheets. You're not, like, trying to, you know, the rules are set up exactly how the codex is. Yeah. So I think it's real helpful. Adam has those sheets. Those things are amazing, dude. Like he just so basically right. he he gave me the little card for each of the models that I was playing, um, the units, and then it was just like here you go. And then anytime I had a question, I flipped to that little card, and bam, here's my information right there. Those were super nice. So I those hopefully are real nice. I really hope that they do something along those lines as well. And I agree that the new edition gives them the opportunity to do a lot of these changes without, you know, getting people super butthurt that, well, you're changing everything all at once. It's like, nope, it's a new edition, so that's why we're changing everything all at once. So, <laughs> right, we'll, right. We'll, we'll see. Um, again, I, ha- I don't have a whole lot of faith in GW doing a really good job because though 8th edition has been a huge improvement, they've also proven that they can just break things immediately as well. I mean, we went, we went from indexes when that came out. 8th edition felt super well done. Felt super balanced overall. Yeah, there was a little bit of stuff, but it was like a, a 10% increase in power or a 10% decrease in this army's, you know, this army's a little bit worse, but everybody felt viable. And then immediately they dropped the Space Marine Codex and it's like, okay, if you're not playing in the Space Marines, you're done. Have a nice day. Go home. <laughs> and then it just was the power creep from then on in. 
for the rest of the time, you know. Oh, yeah, just, especially with Nurgle. The night like summer, that. the summer of the nights, you know, where it was like yeah. when we went to Buckeye, uh, Nick, you were there, obviously. And, <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was like, oh, uh, so we have 60 players and uh, 18 are knights. Like, what? Well, there like the Michigan two, GT. Two the year before. <laughs> the Michigan GT, almost half of them were oh, Space yeah. Marines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. This, this last year was ridiculous. This, uh, yeah. this last year, were, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically if you are in the you know top forty uh, percent area of the tournament, plan on playing Space Marines because it's ninety nine percent positive you're going to play Space Marines. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and I, I played my last three games there uh, versus Space Marines, and it was the exact same cheese dig list with very minor differences. Hey, I was a Space Marine, and I got to play one tier in it. I was happy. <laughs> it's just, but this is silly, man. They, they, like, balance the game. If you want to sell lots of models consistently, stop with the power creep. Let people play what they enjoy. Build it around a balanced game. Build a, If they built a good quality balanced game, tweaked it well, balanced it well, is there going to be some stuff that's going to be a little more powerful? It's going to be stuff that, that's going to be a little bit weaker. And you, you balance from there. You know, you do it just like world of warcraft does where you have balance patches and stuff and yeah you nurse some things and you know you you buff some things or whatever but stop with the 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 yo-yoing effect which is just Mm -hmm. like who's the who's the flavor of the month etc because if you if they just made it consistent everybody would play the army they want to play and i would try new armies and i would enjoy and i would buy new models come up with new models and new stuff rather than just expecting us to buy the model of the week and they're just they're they're playing to the sharks they're playing to the people yeah. who are willing to drop ten thousand dollars on a pre-painted knight army you know because knights are the cool thing of the week and then they're going to sell it in two months when they nerf them and they're going to buy sisters of battle because that's the cool army now all right I, I do agree with the yo-yo, man. They would come out, and that army would be so broken. But you knew the nerf fat was coming. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So just like the just like when everybody was using the Storm Ravens. Remember that mm-hmm. three? And they broke the hell out of that. So then the next weekend, yeah. boots on the ground came out. Yep. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Well, that's our time. Uh, I hope you guys have had fun. I know I have. Um, and I, I really like to look into the new edition. I'm hope I have, I'm hopeful. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm hopeful as well, but I'm not, uh, I don't have a whole lot of faith in GW. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I, I'm, sure right. it'll be, I'm sure it'll be fun regardless. <laughs> like I'm gonna, not going to not play the game and I enjoy eighth edition. I'm sure ninth will be very similar. So, uh, rules right. wise. So I think that'll still be a good game. Just whether they do a really good job of it and actually, you know, listen to people or bring it out balanced, it, you know, bring it out majority where it wins for everybody so we'll see sure all yeah. right guys well have a good saturday thanks to everybody yeah. for coming out and watch have a uh, have a happy and safe holiday too guys yeah. all right be safe out there all right